and we're smack on 10 to so sometimes this has only happened once that I look at a subject and I think I can't do that and um, and that happened this week we were gonna we were gonna go to Cappadocia and we were gonna look at the the cities towns the underground cities of Cappado Cappadocia and I actually thought that the, the subject range was just too great it would be like me doing the Roman Empire in in, an, in, in two hours it just wasn't possible um, it actually frightened me actually because I just thought well um, there are so many of these locations in Cappadocia in, in the heart of Turkey and I just couldn't choose which one to go by so if you don't mind this time I've actually um, decided to go for something completely different and when when we decided to go for this location it was a location that opened up so many doors that I ended up by the end of it just going onto a website and having one of these clicky website things with images and reading out the text so that's where we're going to go and the site is probably a location that nobody has ever heard of ever and if you have heard of this site and you have visited this site in Turkey you will know of its wonders now the, the, the greatness of the archaeology at the site uh, is is beyond belief and it's it's one of those locations which I'm going to grab my little book behind me uh, is actually in the story of archaeology and it's it's a book the story of archaeology that occasionally I, I've, I've looked at over the past few months and the sites that we've been looking at are not in here. So uh, um, the, the book of archaeology by um, Paul Barn, story of archaeology. I, I've usually chosen a subject and I've seen if it's in here and then that's usually helped with my presentation. And this site is no such, such exception, it's actually in here. And this, this site that we're visiting is in the top 100 sites on this planet. So I've said too often, and I'm not going to degrade the archaeology or the history by saying this has got to be in the top 10 of my favourite archaeological sites. Because if I, had a, if I had a pound for every time that I've said that over the past um, two years, um, I probably would be fairly wealthy. So I'm not going to I'm not going to put it in any category. But what I'm going to say is this site containing some of the world's best marble marble carvings blew me away. And the discussion on Tuesday had to end in the evening because we just we just couldn't do any more. So this is actually a, a marble horse with the leg of one of its riders and you have several types of marble there and it's very likely that some of the marble from here was exported all the way around the roman empire and it wouldn't surprise me that some of the sculpted works created at this site ended up in roman britain as well however this started off as a greek site and nobody shout this out this site started off with a greek site and the name of the location is in the name of a god or a goddess associated with ancient Greece. And then what we find is that the carvings at the Sebastion were then created um, in the reign of Emperor Augustus. And then it flows into the period of the 100s and the 200s. And this is one of those locations that was lost in history. And by about the 1200s, it completely disappeared. You know, the other week we did um, Temesos, and that was another location that completely mm. disappeared from history. And one of the things that was remarked on Tuesday evening was that there are so many locations in Turkey that are unique within the archaeological record of whole cities. And this site itself was not found until 1904 but the archaeology there is absolutely stunning just like 
this arrangement of columns behind me. And also, if you look at the floor, you can actually see it's paved with marble. So if you, you hear those stories about streets being paved with gold, well, marble is gold, basically, to these people. It's their wealth. They had a whole school of carvers there. They had a sculptor's school. This site had one, two stadiums. This site is said to have held Olympic style games. This site is a place of learning. This place is a, a site of architecture. This site is a site of civilization. It's also a site of Christianity. It's also a site of theatrical plays. All, all the works of the ancients were actually perform, um, performed at this city. Uh, the, this, the, these at the um, Seba from the Sebastian. Now, actually, the building known as the Sebastian is is actually a part of it. Is actually still standing, not just ground floor level, not just first floor level, but it's still standing part of the building on second floor level. This is a Pompeii without being buried by volcanic ash. And the other amazing thing about this site is, other than a few marbles that happened to be nicked by the British when the site was discovered in 1905 at the British Museum. Most of the most of the marbles are actually there. In fact, the marbles here are far better quality than anything that the Pantheon, uh, um, uh, Parthenon has to offer, or even the Pantheon has to offer. So no clues to where this is, is yet. And that gives you an idea of the scale of some of these carvings. The, the streets, the streets were adorned with so many, so many carved statues, so many carved pillars um, and this site was so full of carved work that when they went to build the wall around the city in around 350 years AD they actually used beautiful carved stone to do it this is one of the only cities that I know on the planet that actually uses marble to clad the interior and exterior of their city wall a, a city wall that is four times the circumference of the banking at Maiden Castle. Now that gives you an idea of the of the vastness of this site. So one thing one thing I, I need to pop and get a minute. I need to grab my bag over there because there's a little note in there. So if you bear with me in a minute. Still think where this is. I'm, it's gonna be seconds. Those seconds dragged into minutes, and those minutes dragged into hours, and the relationship dragged into years, and she didn't leave me until that point. That was quite morbid, actually. So I, I've got a little, I needed my little plan, where I've got my Sebastian, my Tetraphylon, my Stadium, my Stadium, my Agora, my Columns, my Baths of Hadrian. Do you know what I'm gonna do, right? I'm gonna- Could we have a map, please? No. <laughs> Can we have a name of a city? Name, name of the city? It. We must have missed that. Uh, because I haven't even given you the name of the city yet. Oh, all yeah. oh, right. Okay. Okay. It's still it's still a mystery. So, a, any any guesses where this this is? No. Yeah. <laughs> Not yet. Right. See, obviously they weren't listening because Goff knew that I hadn't given the name of the city yet. Oh, we were, well, we've been chatting, so we, we just thought, thought we missed it. Yeah, we thought we might I have missed it. No, it. yeah, I can't believe you were chatting. Now, cut your mics and let me and Goff um, concentrate. <laughs> Goff, did you see that? I was really firm there. It was. Yeah, that's the all, way. All those, <laughs> all those nattering women, right? <laughs> so, again, again, look at that carved out of marble. A, a corner piece for a building. And when I entertained my Roman session yesterday I kept saying that that the columns behind me just one of the buildings at this site is more in the range of advanced Roman remains um, at one building within this locality than the whole of Britain right we do have run one Roman building in this country that is several stories high and that's the lighthouse at Dover but other than that we've got nothing on this scale in Britain at all and, but that's another lesson altogether. Look at that. 
we, we've got we've got a wonderful almost like a Prometheus we, we've got a, a winged carving um, into marble and again this is only one of many many from the site and look at that you're going down some of the back walls of this city you can see the height of these remains does that remind you of Pompeii yes it does but it's not Pompeii at all and we're slowly getting to the secret look at that now if you were suddenly I tell you I tell you what like there's an image coming up and I just I just could stop on the an image coming up but I could stop on this so so what what you're what you're doing you, you you're going down this, this avenue um, and on the right and on the left there's shops so you've got the veranda on the left and the right now now this is in the Corinthian style this is actually at the stage where this city was of Roman um, but they, they they could actually eat marble and and there's so much of the site that hasn't been excavated can you see the level over there that level hasn't been excavated there's there's in fact this site itself there's so little in the way of domesticated buildings being excavated that I would like to see one of the, more of the domestic domestic structures for the everyday vulgaris because I'd like to see how the common people live because I'm sure the common people would have had marble lintels and marble windows windows as well it's a bit like a comparison if we want to talk about say Crete where on Crete there's so much wealth on Crete at the time of the Minoans for example that even the poor people have got gold but that's thousands of years before this this site um, well 1500 years before this site and, and um, so what what you've got you've got the two types of marble there and this is all quarried nearby and we've got thousands tens and tens and tens of thousands of 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 tons of marble being quarried to create this site and even even the core building material for these walls is marble and and if you if you look over there just sort of just sort of in the little bit of the vista in front of us that's actually pay it paved with with a checkerboard style right which we're going to actually look at it, it, it's a checkerboard um, tiles on the floor um, which are beyond these um, marble slabs floor slabs so this is how luxuriant this this site is now what you do see at this site for example if you look over and let's just sort of get the let's just get the annotation in there and I've got to be very careful not to overrun today because I've got a lot to get through. That column obviously hasn't collapsed, right? But there are signs of some of these columns being reconstructed. That hasn't collapsed. That hasn't collapsed. That's obviously been reconstructed here. But the, the slab, the, these slabs haven't been reconstructed. These walls are up as they are. That's not been reconstructed. That has been reconstructed. That's been reconstructed. But maybe that hasn't been reconstructed because the Corinthian capital in it that looks like it hasn't collapsed. So there's lots of stuff here that has been reconstructed and lots of stuff that hasn't. But the remains themselves, as we start to get onto the next image, and sorry I've got to move on. As we move on and we go, I tell you what, this to me is magic because it, it hairs up on the back of my neck it's, this is absolute magic it's, it's like being it's like being in a in for me right being in a chocolate shop having to eat I, I can eat chocolate right it's not gonna do me any harm I could just sit there and look and touch those walls um, photograph them draw them um, have that sort of communication with the walls I, that that's just one tiny bit of the city and you, you, you're looking at walls standing several stories above you and you're looking at the arch beautifully carved all made of marble all the subtleties of the ancient world but in a snapshot in shot in front of you just just a, just a little wonder but the whole city is a wonder in fact I'm gonna say it this is this is to me far more wondrous than Ephesus I, do, I wouldn't want to go to Ephesus if somebody said you right you, you you can only visit one site ever in your lifetime in Turkey right forget Cappadocia even forget Temesos even forget some of the cities of Lycia forget Ephesus I would go here this is where I would go if that was a question because here you've got the the three the three ancient orders of architecture you've got Doric you've got Ionic you've got 
Corinthian, you've got Greek that then gives away gives way to ancient Rome. You've got buildings that haven't been reconstructed, buildings that have been reconstructed. You've got streets, you've got colonnades, you've got water systems, you've got um, art, architecture, sport, quarrying, you've got everything there. And I still haven't given the name and it's it's a greedy thing that I'm keeping this from you today. But what I'm going to do and give credit where it's due is actually read out from here. The exploration of the city of Aphrodisias. Aphrodisias. It's basically in the south western corner just above Lycia within the landscape of Turkey. The landscape spreads over an area of 500 hectares including the quarry quarries. The city itself, the walls around the core of the city with the ornate grand buildings is an area of 75 hectares. If you want to put that into perspective if you think about the Millennium Stadium, probably about four hectares in area. This is 75 hectares. This is vast. It's associated with a river. It's 600 meters above sea level. This, if I, if I, if I can give grandeur to the following sentence, this has made an important contribution to our understanding of civic life in the Eastern Roman Empire. But I, and I'm going to say everyone here listening and watching this has probably never heard of the city at all. I might be wrong. But it's got the Agora, the civic centre, the market, Odeons, concert halls, the Aphrodite temple, baths, all beginning thousands of years ago. It's said that the site itself may derive its origins from about 5,000 years ago into the period where Aphrodite is the great deity. This is the city that's founded around a temple associated with her within the realms of the Greek world. Let's not talk about Alexander the Great visiting here. Let's talk about the beginnings of something wondrous and great. Let's talk about a city that lasted a thousand years. Let's talk about a city that was at its height around 100 years AD, so 1,900 years ago. This may not seem important or relevant to any of you, but it is to me. This site in the 1960s was being extensively excavated, not by an American, not by a Frenchman or a Brit, or even an Italian or a German. This site is actually being excavated by the very eminent Turkish archaeologist Kenan Arem. And this Kenan Arem was able to say, it is our history. It is our, it is our sense of our past. And the site has been cherished and loved from that moment onwards. The site is an example of the discovery of a site that archives itself. The inscribed stones around the city are so numerous that most of them have been left in situ. You can go down the street and read references to a burial of somebody, or I built this structure, or this is the baker's. It's a bit like Pompeii, but on a much grander scale. And, Gotta be honest with you, some bits of this city are much better preserved than the Italian city of Pompeii. Another amazing thing with the city, and as we move the image, is this. And can anyone guess what this means? But think about it, and I'll ask in a few moments. This city was given the freedom by the emperor. It was given the freedom and the honour of a free city within the Roman world. Within the, er, within the early years of the reign of Octavian, otherwise known as the first emperor of the Roman Empire, 
Augustus Caesar. Aphrodisius was keen to promote its own position amongst the world within Rome. Mm -hmm. Many people saw themselves as being free to express themselves in the inscription and the dedication of a new great temple of Aphrodite. There are more Salia. There are personifications of the city and people of Aphrodisius as well as manliness and honour crown himself reflecting the way that he has brought distinction to his own city in inscriptions. Although the city was technically free, the embodiment of Rome was enshrined in the very essence of everything that was around people that visited the city. In fact, the people of Aphrodisius so much embodied the ideals of Rome that everything became Roman. The sculpting, the carving, everything was of the Roman moment. Flanked, colonnaded uh, courtyards, various porticos, reliefs, everything in, in being with ancient Rome. This was the place to go to understand the imperial family, what that was the Roman world. Inscriptions record various projects. The inscriptions, we know who was building what. We, we actually know who was carving many of the carvings. Basically, what, 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 what would be done, and there's so many videos about this site out there, and, and lots of the videos are done with really good taste. You have people in a dream world wandering around this city. They, they forget why they're there, and they're just talking, and wow, this city, and these walls, and these, the, 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 these carvings, and the pediments above us. And, and they, they talk of... The, the, the artists were so keen on telling people who they were that behind the heads you have the you have the carving of, of the of the sculpture it's a sculptor at, at the back of the head so it basically say I, I, I carved this right and um, and the other thing as well is there would be little indications to who um, these works were about and if nobody's guessed this city is linked to Roman Britain. Listen to this. This is Claudius subduing a personification of Britannia that reflects his victorious invasion in AD 43. So this city so far away from Roman Britain told us about Roman Britain. And I love that little bit of detail. That's, that's Claudius, the embodiment of Claudius, pushing down and to be dominant over Britannia. There's no sense of rape or pillaging. It's a sense that now Britannia is now subdued. And there she is, personification of Britannia herself. And we know that because the carving tells us. <laughs> it's no guess. It's no guess at all. And we've missed an image. Oh, look at that. A few years after the carving associated with Claudius and his victorious invasion of Roman Britain in AD 43, we see this. It's a statue of Agrippina and that man there, Emperor Nero. He's given the laurels of office within the sense of the Claudian family. And Agrippina, after he's given the laurels and the carving of the imperial family of Rome within the wonderful building that we will look at, the Sebastian, within four years, Nero assassinates his own kin, his own mother, Agrippina. And this is all recorded at the site. This is all there for all of us to see. So the whole story of Rome is within this city. If you want to learn about Rome, go here. Don't go to Rome. Go to, go to Rome itself at Aphrodisius. Because the story of Rome is here. Nowhere, nowhere else as well preserved. You can read it. 
you can gently touch the marbles as you go through the museum and you can sit alongside the marbles and look at them in awe and ask, ask, answer questions. You know? um, so this site is, is, a, is a walking library and there it is. You can see Aphrodisius there. Just, to, well, I said just above Lycia, sort of within that, sort of north of it, really, within the old free cities of Lycia. But you, well, you're looking at this and, and you're looking at it, that image above and you're thinking, well, we've seen some really impressive stuff. And that's actually a disappointing image for me because you see other images like that. But what you do see are the other images that we're going to see today. You can see why I decided to bottle out of doing Cappadocia. And I admit it, I was just, and then I became overwhelmed by this. But the difference was, even I became overwhelmed by the subject matter, I fell in love with it. I, I fell deeply in love with it. It's one of my mistresses, don't tell Michelle. And I'll give you another clue. One of my other mistresses is York, but we don't want to go there. So um, this, this, this is rather, this is rather, um, this is a plan of the city. This is that um, 75 um, hectare site with, with everything, with the roads beyond the walls of the expanse of the Vicus with, with, in regards to, to the bigger city. We believe that within these walls, uh, over 10,000 people lived. The expanse of the walls and the city sprawling outside all the way up to the quarries, many more tens of thousands of people. Uh, actually, actually, because this city was so crammed with, with buildings of, of great note, it would have been difficult to have actually lived. So I think 10,000 is probably about right. But some of the stadia and the theatres here, um, you, you could accommodate thousands of thousands of more people, thousands more people. 20,000 people, for example, in the stadia above there. 20,000 people. If we want to be precise, 24,000. So obviously 10,000 people building in amongst the, living within amongst the walls. The others must have come from outside, so that's where we've got, we've got the clues. So, um, and and the the great thing is is actually they they there's a, the museums on site. You know, it's, it's all it's not a stuffy museum either. It's it, it's um it's an illuminated museum. Do you, do you know what I I've the, I, I was caught out again on Tuesday, and and I didn't actually show the slides of the museum on Tuesday. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to take us through a little bit of one of the aisles um, of Aphrodisias Museum. Uh, and as I say, there's so, you know, there, there's so many um, videos on YouTube about this site. It, 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 it is it is unbelievable. Uh, I'm just going to get this up on here and just sort of bring, bring, bring this. I'm just going to show you um, I just want to get these images up. Hang on a minute. Let's just uh, uh, images. Let's just go. Ah, uh, right. L let's just show this now. And let's let's have wow factor. Right. Um, here we go. And let's share on three. New share on two. One. That's what you're getting straight off the internet. That that's just one gallery at the museum on the right there. Have you seen anything like it? You can go down there and you can actually look at these carvings. I look at the floor, look at the lighting. It's absolutely look at that there. Whole, whole. Uh, it, it, it's it, it's it's amazing, and it's just a museum dedicated. Uh, look at that. The, these were these were part of the story of the Sebastian, and and there. Look at these beautiful carvings. There's just so much to see. There's really so much to see at this site. If you if you just go there and you just go into the museum, and there's there's our there's our dob in there, um, and uh, again. It's just so, it's so much. It, it's just so much in one area. If if you ever go to a site like this, this you need to actually spend a few days. And, and do you know do you know what I'd like to do? Going back to the city, I would like to just go into those fields and just have a look around, follow the hedgerows, and see bits of masonry sticking up and touch the wall. And and do you know what you can you can read the wall uh, as a book because it uses ornamental carvings and inscriptions in the wall from various tombs and, 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 and great temples associated with Aphrodite and can tell a story of a whole family of Claudius by looking at the wall, that the city wall itself. 
and and you, you don't need, you don't need to dig here and you don't need to find I tell you what finding a gold or a silver coin on the surface here would, would be nothing right the carvings are the gold the marble is the gold you don't go here to to, to look at gold statuary you go to here to look at the marble work and there's a plan there, there we go this 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 wonderful plan in front of us and do you know what I'd like to do now I've got a nice little bit of text that I'm just going to read out to you it's um Oh, it, it, was, it was it was one of those I'll, I'll do this little bit of text by here and I've got a nice bit of text on the screen that I'm going to do so in many ways this city is is so much more than architecture listen to this I read it straight out of the book actually wealthy members of the community also left money to the city in order to fund festivals and details have been provided by a series of inscriptions all over the place. For example, in the late 100s, money was left for a musical contest by one Flavius Lysimachus. A music contest, not, not, not sort of a gladiatorial contest, a music contest, it's great. The establishment of the, of, of the games named in his honor, games associated with the music contest in his honor were to be take place every four years. Sounds a bit like the Olympic Games, doesn't it? So they've got their own Olympic Games. And their Olympic Games is not just associated with athletics. It's associated with, um, with, with choirs, ancient comedies. They've got games associated with harp singers, um, flautists and all sorts of things. Does that sound very similar to the Eisteddfod? It does. <laughs> it does, it does. Every four years though, every four years. Um, so, so basically, you can imagine that in those stadia, you, you might have individual, not just athletic tracks, but individual people competing for people's attention in the stadia, as they would all rate, um, and, and, and maybe hearing musical instruments being played and all the rest of it. It's it, it's so much more. So it's not, and then they've got the purely athletic festivals as well. Get into that. And, and studies of these structures, you've you've also got, you've also got games associated with gardeners. We, we, we've got we've got associations with um, um, festivals associated with associations of gardeners, uh, gardeners, and you've got um, festivals associated with the gold workers, and the marble quarry quarry workers, and. And the, the other thing as well is people in society had different statuses associated with their trade. So the people who were most, were most cherished in the society would have undoubtedly been those statue makers, those quarry, well, those quarry men and women. And within the stadia, they would take pride of place under canopies. And seating would be allotted to people um, who had underwritten also the building of structures within this city. So if you were rich, this would guarantee you access into heaven. Well, I mean by that, it would guarantee you a good spot in the stadium. Who cares about anything else? Yeah, you could spend all day there, couldn't you? Wolf nipple chips, get them while they're hot. Um, Jaguar's earlobes. Anyway. So, um, Monty Python, there you go. Albatross, what's that? Be goal on the stick. Yeah, that'll, that'll do. That'll do. Um, so, I can remember selling my book in, my, my Roman book in Barry one year. It was um, back in 2014. And I was outside WH Smith's because I was selling books in WH Smith's. And I would go past, every time somebody went past, would you like to buy any wolf nipple chips? Get them while they're hot. And people were coming home asking, um, people were coming over asking if they saw, if I sold wolf nipple chips. Um, and uh, yeah, very strange Barry people. And I would say that that, that um, when I come out with my next book, Roman book, they will get a free pack of wolf nipple chips. I hopefully Ooh. people have forgotten that. But anyway, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read. I'm going to, uh, we've got this now, and I'm just going to look at that there. That's the um, that's the tef, um, tetraphylon, or tetrapylon. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to read a little bit of text out, and which relates directly to the plan. So we've got the agora, the market, the stadium one, stadium two, 
we've got the temple of Aphrodite, we've got over here the thermos, the, the bars of Hadrian, we've got the grand basilic um, colonnade, we've got theatre, we've got theatre, um, we've got um, the civil um, basilica, we've got um, another theatre, we've got the gymnasium, um, the tetraphylon, these, these, these were usually set up in the middle of cities associated with, with the crossroads. And you would look up and you'd see wonders. Right, you've got to see the videos about this site, which I'm not showing you today. You've got to go on YouTube after watching a video from my own channel. Um, so let, let's, let's just carry on and read. Let's just get a little bit of reading in you. <coughs> so I've just got to move that there and bingo. Now, when I was doing research for this, this came up as one of the top 10 sites uh, within the province of Carrier within Turkey. And I thought, if this is one of the top sites in Carrier in Turkey, would this actually match in the top 10 sites in Turkey? Because there's so much in Turkey. And there's whole cities that haven't been discovered in Turkey yet. I'm not sure there's whole cities like this, but you never know, you never could be. Aphrodisius, the beautiful ancient Greek um, city of Aphrodisius. Still, still only partly excavated, is one of the most important archaeological sites of the late Hellenistic and Roman uh, period in Turkey, I would say the world. The city was located in inland Caria on a plateau 600 metres above sea level. Today it lies near, near a village known as Geri. Um, the city was founded, uh, the big, what you're seeing within the city from that plan the Temple of Aphrodite, it goes back to about 150 years BC, but early evidence goes back about 5,000 years. It was famous for his sanctuary of Aphrodite, naturally given its name, which was the city's patron goddess. And it's known for its sculpt sculptural school, which rose in prominence throughout the ages and definitely under the reign of Emperor Hadrian. I I'm really thinking that we we've got some um, carvings that have been um, some sculptures that have actually come over to Britain. That's what I'm thinking. Um, so Aphro Aphrodisius enjoyed a period of prosperity, um, a rich period of prosperity, but by around the late 400s, the city starts to decline, but it was a slow decline. It wasn't the Seneca collapse. It still continued on with a few bishops and as buildings were lost and things and people started to move away. It's probably because marble was not the thing that it had been before. Even though we're building the Agia Sophia, Sophia in the um, five, 540s, um, even in, under the reign of Just, Justinian, a uh, Roman, uh, um, Eastern Roman Emperor, Byzantine Emperor, it's, it's likely even then that, that this city is starting to really go into decline, but it's still hanging on. So with the great marketplace, with, with the um, Sebastian, which is definitely de dedicated to the Julio-Claudian um, dynasty. And then what, we, then what we have, many of the statues and sculptural elements that have been unearthed during the course of excavations bear signatures of Aphrodisian sculpture. So we, so we know. The museum itself was actually opened in 1979, so the, the, Tur the Turkish authorities were really keen to show this off. And the Turkish authorities have done a massively great job of, of saying, of stating that this is a site that we are really, really proud of. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to show you some images and um, I'm going to show you these images now. And if we want to screen share, new share, a few little images on here. So. As, as we sort of move up on the screen, and I've got, there you go. As we move up on the screen, we can see there Nero and Agrippina. I've already shown you that, but that's really nice and clear. Um, and then what we've got, the, a relief of the three graces. I tell you the proportions on those bodies are absolutely perfect. Um, it, 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 it's a really beautiful relief, the, the, the buttocks, the, the legs. Uh, the 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 arms, the head, the hair, absolutely beautiful. But that that's that's just many examples of from the city. That's the Sebastian. I mentioned the Sebastian. That tells you the story about the um, Julio Claudio family. There's some there, but the rest are in the museum. That's still standing at its original height. Amazingly enough, it's still its original height. 
How this was missed until 1900, 1904, I don't know. But there, there was the story has it, as it does. I was wandering down the street one day and I was taking photographs and there was something and I took a photograph of it. Photographs came back to the Western world um, and people got excited and from uh, more or less within the moment it was found in, in 1904. French archaeologists went out there. The British Museum took one or two um, objects to the British Museum. Uh, probably had no choice, the, the local authorities, and but most of the artefacts are there. I think there's a few in, uh, there's a few carvings in the Bibliothèque Nationale, but most are actually still in Turkey. The bars of Hadrian, do you see those little, do you see the floor there? It looks like, it, it looks like something that you might actually find in a house in the 1930s or the 1940s or something like that, kitchen floor. But the, 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 this is a little bit of an image of the baths. Uh, that's that's a, a nice little um, fountain bath in front of us with a beautiful column. A lot more to actually see at this at this location associated, associated with the bath. But you've got the beautiful checkerboard tiles on the floor there. Absolutely amazing. And look at that, the running track. That gives you an idea of the scale of the running track. This is a northern running track with bits of the walls still intact. Um, and you can imagine thousands of people being in that running track to get access to this. Now, this is interesting to get access to this. Um, you, you would have you would have gone from the center of the city, as you can see from the plan there. Um, no, you can't. You haven't got the plan up there anymore. So, so you go from the center of the city and the, and the roads would lead directly north and you'd go up steps and then you'd go down. And, and, and you would see what was going on. There, there's no actual entrances on ground level. The, the, what you can see, that little black thing in the distance, that's actually, for, that's the changing rooms for the uh, performers or whoever they are. And I'll, I'll use Jessica's own words from Tuesday night. Uh, after the lecture, she referred to this as an example of a city that you don't see a sense of war associated with it. We don't mention war. We don't mention death pillage, rape, murder, mm. anything negative. It, it, it's a very different phenomena. A very different phenomena. And again, some some more, uh, this is the representation of the Temple of Aphrodite. I think we've got one more up there. And the Tetra uh, Pylon. Now, actually, to be honest with you, that, that um, bits of that have been reconstructed it looks impressive but is it impressive well when i actually when i actually watched the videos about the site people looking up at this and you had people standing alongside this and i thought that is bloody impressive that is really impressive it it it's it's it, it, again a miniature wonder of the ancient world and aphrodisius so what I'm going to do is I'm going to comp complete the images that I've actually got and go back to the plan. So, again, all, all the roads leading north to the stadium, um, the Tetra uh, Pylon, and you've got the theatres and the Agora, and you've got everything going on with this site. Absolutely beautiful. So as, as, we, as we move on, and yes, you're looking up at the... Um, tetrapylon the tetrapylon and obviously some of those columns are standing in situ and they haven't been moved um, bits of the um, pediment above obviously that that's been bits of that have been reconstructed that's fair enough but what you're seeing is very much what people were seeing a hundred and 120 odd years ago um, before some of the limited reconstruction that has actually occurred to this. Two types of the marble associated with the site. Um, the work, the work again, is, is, is amazing. And we showed you this image earlier on. I said, oh, it looks a little bit disappointed. But, but, what, what we've, but the reason is that looks disappointing compared with, hang on a minute, if we want to move back to that. But then again, I'm being hard on these remains. So obviously the, the, the Temple of Aphrodite again, and they've only excavated a small amount of this site. And to be honest with you, we don't really need to excavate any more other than the areas where the Volgaris lived. 
it'd be nice to see some of the homes of the common people uh, just just to put a little building over that and just to sort of see what they were living with how they were having intercourse with the city how how their homes relates to the bigger picture and that's more that i would that's more to what i would like to see associated with this wonderful site i i gotta be honest with you that looks really something that does really that really really does it it, it, uh, it take it it takes it takes everything to think that this is only a little bit of what survives within the city and this is actually the the stadium which is in the heart of the city now there was there was one thing that i there, there was one thing that i really wanted to question now the thing i'd like to question is what all this stuff is here and what all this stuff is here now what what's happening is that when archaeologists are excavating great cities like this they collect all the all the cut and dress stone and they put it in one area and to hopefully at one point use this to actually um, uh, be organized in reconstruction but if you look along here most of this hasn't been reconstructed you can see the shadows of the columns as they drape all the way down and the columns keep going to actually flank the sides of the great agora the marketplace just north of this in the heart of the city so this is before they completely excavated this part of the site they've now excavated all of this but you can you can see by the shadow that you've got several meters of earth that they are, that they're excavating i gotta be honest with you this is one site that i've not actually bothered to make the effort to find if what pottery they've actually found at the site because th there must be shed loads of there must be hangers full of pottery other artifacts but i've just focused on the architectural backdrop of the site and, uh, and around around this as well what you can see is that there is a whole set of colonnades around the whole thing so the stadium within <coughs> these colonnades so i think that's 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 really an interesting point there so so the stadium is an architectural wonder within an architectural wonder <laughs> an, ar an architectural vista a an architectural understanding we get we're getting that understanding with the site and again this is this is the northern um, stadium now i was looking at some very early photographs of this and um i'm not sh yeah i was looking at some very early photographs of this from the early 1900s and the images from the early 1900s basically showed it as it is now except with a load of trees that there were loads of trees in it the earth level had built up a little bit but you could actually make this out and 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 i'm just thinking why this was missed it was probably missed because <laughs> local people in turkey have so much of this it's everywhere but i think i think it was off the beaten track now one point that was made on tuesday was that the reason why this didn't have a wall around it around an early time and the reason why this didn't wasn't affected by by war is because it's much further inland where you get the likes of ephesus and you you get the other sites along the coast even if you want to look at constantinople they've got walls around them well this didn't need a wall it only needed a wall in about the 350s because they decided to build one and by the way their wall is one of the best city walls anywhere on the planet because it's made of solid marble not just any old marble it's 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 it, they, they had so much of it they could just chuck it up from buildings that were already in the city it was great why they built the wall around it it must have been to go with the joneses but we've got a far better wall than anyone my wall's better than yours keith all right no it isn't it is look oh, at that man. shut up but look at that, Keith, that again, the carving and detail in that. And again, if we put it on its side and we sort of stretch it across the screen, look at that there, the, the, the beautiful cherubs, the, the representations again of this world, the, the sense of who they are. They, 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 had, they had so much time on their hands that they had all schools of, 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 of sculptors, right? 
they, they, they could they could hack away to their heart's delight and create this and if they made a mistake I, I don't know just toss it in the city wall it's fine you know everyone makes a mistake so what I'd like to do now is that I would like to probably maybe go on to a little bit of a break and um, but before we go on to a break um, um, obviously we will we'll do the other stuff after after the break let's see if there's any questions so let, let's just see where we go right first of all do you know what we should do should we let the rabble let their vent out and then we can mute them mute the buggers and then we can get on with a, a sensible lot come on then <laughs> right rabble speak oh um what happened to the city in the end was it just is it abandoned Actually, can we just see if there's any other questions from, from you guys, and I'll answer that question, Sam. Uh, you, you've, you've mentioned Sebastian a few times. What is the Sebastian? Uh, the, the, the Sebastian is the location of the um, representation of the carvings and the deity associated with the um, 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 Giulio-Claudio uh, family, the, the early imperial family of Rome. That's what that is. So any other questions from you guys? What's the etymolo etymology of that? Right, okay. The I've got to work I'll work out what the meaning of the Sebastian means after the break. <laughs> now, if you would have actually asked that in the first place, I would I would have um, I would have. But it's only Kathy it knows these complicated shot. words. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, right. So, right. What happened to the city? That's a really good question, and I can answer it now. I don't have a problem with that. Um, well. I, I think the 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 marble was so important to the the local industry and 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 the trade guilds that when when the Eastern Roman world was the only flag bearer of the Roman Empire, obviously half its trade completely disappeared. So we've lost half half its export. So that's gonna that's gonna affect. Um, that's going to affect um, its market and obviously at that point as well along the eastern borders of the Roman Empire in the um, late 400s 500s and with the advent of the Justinian plague by about the fourth uh, by about the 540s at the same time that the Agus Superior is being constructed is probably that the the market was actually starting to uh, disappear um, even though we've got evidence of small scale work being produced into the six seven hundreds, it was not on the earlier scale, and slowly but surely the, the city started to fall into decline massively. Um, but <coughs> it wasn't a Seneca collapse because people are still there's still recordings of some activity at the site into the twelve hundreds. But after the twelve hundreds, that's the nail on the coffin. That's it. And then the city's lost for 700 years. It is lost. It, it's not like Ephesus where you've got famous people going to Ephesus. You've got associations with famous people with this, but not actual preachers like um, like St. Saint, Saint Peter or St. Paul or any of anything like that, like, like Ephesus has. So I, I think it just fell into the wayside. I think marble, marble becomes unimportant as a material to adorn the outsides of your building. Um, and hang on a minute, let's just uh, mute that. Um, and that that is coined by what's happening in Rome. In the in the five hundreds, the outside cladding of the Colosseum is removed, and that's all marble. So you can see that the importance of marble in stately buildings is starting to decline, um, and it, it that means the decline of the city, and that's exactly what happened. Chris. <laughs> Carl, do you think that Christianity, advent of Christianity, had anything to do with it? Because, um, you know, Aphrodite, it's big business, wasn't it? You know, yes, temples it... and visitors come in. Yes. And sort of, you know, with Hadrian, Christianity sort of took off, really, didn't it? Was it Hadrian yes. who became a Christian? No, no, Con Con no not Hadrian. Constantine yeah. the Great. Con yeah, but it's sort of around that time, isn't it? And then perhaps, you know, they had less visitors, less. You know, they were yes. making less money with the temples and um, also Augustus and Claudius were gods too. So. Yes, that's right. Well, there, there's, an, there's an interesting thing. If you've got Ephesus down the down 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 further down, right, um, and the Temple of Artemis as well, 
the Temple of Artemis and, and this site and all the other sites that, that are bowing into the pagan trade for people visiting different gods and so on. Slowly but surely, I think that's a really good good inferred um, idea that obviously Ephesus is taking away all the all the all the um, all, all the all the pagans and, and people going on, on pilgrimages. So people ain't going on pilgrimages to the Temple of Aphrodite as much as they were. And that's a good point as well. So so these two things, the decline in the mar the requirement of marble and obviously the, the change in, in religion, I think that's going to really um, hit this city. And the other thing as well is people are more coastal dwelling at this time. The, the environment has changed. Um, temp temperatures within the region have changed and, and it's like Temesos as we did a few weeks ago things change quite dramatically and, and, and that's where we're going yeah I, I, that, that, would, that would tie in as well yes it would Chris um, um, Mail Chris the, um, I know what you mean the, the sculpting there is obviously of unique <laughs> quality were, were those skills exported in the sense that there was a a school of sculpting in Aphrodisias, and you know, I mean, would there be, for example, say, sculpting work done elsewhere in Turkey, where somebody would say, "Oh, that's obviously from the school of," it's it's their style or whatever. I I, I think there's an important uh, point. Yeah, I'm, I'm told to call you Arnold. Um, I think there's an important point here that we've got specifically the the patron for the school of uh, of um, artisans, you know, the sculptures, the sculptors for for Aphrodisius is actually Hadrian himself so uh, and so he's the main patron um, and then it then it goes on from there to be greater and, and bigger and then slowly but surely things massively change and um, when things when sculpt it, it's not that um, the sculpting school declines because sculpt people are sculpting elsewhere it's because the requ requirement of the the marble, you know, and, and, and carving marble uh, declines, and, and that's what more happens rather than competition from other sculptors. Yeah, uh, and there there were there, there there we've got a building on on which we might be able to look at after the break. There's a building that's actually marked as the school of sculptors within this city. We 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 know that we've got evidence, and obviously we've got the quarries, um, which are which are just a few few miles. Um, northeast of here, um, well, like when I say a few miles, not not that far away. We can see that on the plan, but um, but that's a really important to see that the that the industry here is based around uh, the sculptors and obviously the Temple of Aphrodite. And if you put those two and, and one of them starts to decline and then the other one declines, then we lose the city. So we've got answers to understanding why it wasn't lost because there was an earthquake, because lots of the buildings are still standing in a good state of preservation. We can't blame earthquakes. We can't blame warfare either. We can't blame any of these things. We can't blame drought, but that might have a little bit of a, a, a factor, right? But if you've got a city that, you know, you're going to take goods there. So it, it, it's, it's all those things. So Keith. Uh, no, no, nothing really. I love it. I am. I've never heard of it before, but uh, really good. Thank you, darling. Um, and um, what else? Who else are we going to do? We're going to do Goff, darling Goff, my my love, love of my life. Don't leave me, Goff. I won't leave you. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful place, and it just goes to show the um, the the the, the um, confirms the influence that the Romans had in their culture and architecture. The eastern part of the Mediterranean, doesn't it? Yes, yes, and we, we sometimes forget that we we've got our we've got our own Rome in our hearts, haven't we? The legacy of our Rome is Christianity, and we've all been brought up in schools and um, with Christianity and, and whatever, and 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 then the the off thing about Jesus and and, and the Romans and um, Herod and so on. Those are our ideas of Rome because we don't have these types of buildings in Britain. So, but this is Rome itself, and I think I think forgetting this was in the book that this is a this is a pure demonstration of a civic roman city not just yep. in not just in not just there but everywhere and also the point that i made yesterday in my roman class is the the big question was being asked why don't we have remains like this in britain and the answer is quite clear this was a city that was already a city 200 years before the Romans came over to Britain. They, they, they had a track record 
right? People already knew what, a, the, you know, the Temple of Artemis um, just down the road had already been there quite quite a few years. You know, people were used, to, uh, the Parthenon was built uh, 440 odd years BC. Within that sort of, well, I know that's in Greece, but you've got all these wonderful sites. Um, you, you've got um, Delphi and Ephesus and everything developing. So, so this stuff is hundreds of years before us. So when we're introduced with a temple like the like the great temple of Claudius at Colchester, we don't know what to bloody make of it because one of the, one of the things that we do see in in, in Britain, right, is that um, we we see this great temple of Claudius at Colchester, and that's being built about forty four years um, AD. The the tallest building in Britain at that point wasn't even that height so you've got this towering temple we're not used to these buildings and in londinium by about a hundred years ad there's a basilica that towers over the landscape it could be seen for miles around we'd see nothing like that um and be because we've got no history with maintenance of these buildings and understanding these buildings and a need before and after when Roman civilization starts to collapse, we don't know what to do with these buildings. And even within the Roman world in Britain by about 350, we're already demolishing the basilicas and the theatres. Right? We're already demolishing the, the basilicas um, and the, the temples because they're just too vast for the small population. To Stonehenge? That, that's a rockery on the end of the A303, so we won't even bring that into it. So it's all building, a big building. It might be a big building, but it's it's dwarfed by somewhere like the, the Temple of Claudius. Um, so that's what we're talking about. And the other thing as well is the Romans built the Romans built in stone, right? When when the Romans met us first in Britain, most of their buildings, other than if you go to somewhere like Orkney, most of the buildings are made of um, organic material. They're, they're made of timber and daub. Stonehenge is in history by then. It's already an ancient site. People building in stone was was already old hat in Britain, right? So so we so all those things go out the window. So um, yes, I've gone on a complete tangent, Jane. And let's yeah, have you, yeah, Jane. No. No questions. It is amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. It, it is amazing, and 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 I will say it um, before Goff says it. I'm a, I'm also amazing. Thanks, Goff. So um, we're we're gonna we're gonna. Oh no, actually no, we're not gonna have a break yet because I, I want to do an article of the week. Um, I've already shown you those stamps, so I've got a nice little article of the week. Right, we're still we're still putting all these online. So where's this? Who's stolen my article of the week? I bet you it's Michelle. She, it was on my desk a minute ago. Where's that blooming article? Hang on, hang on a minute. Let, let me find this a minute. Give, give, oh, there it is. It's in front of me. Oh, dippy docus. I love this article, right? Um, I, we'll read this one out, right? It was, um, okay. There, there, there you go, right? They found a, a, a bishop's palace in somebody's garden. A 1200 bishop's palace has been found in my garden and it has cost me £15,000 to get the archaeologists in to excavate it, protect it and record it. Um, so beware, Goff, if you ever retire and you want to extend your house into your garden. A retiree having a bungalow built faces a £15,000 bill after an ancient palace was uncovered in his garden. Now, this guy always knew there was a palace in his garden, right? But he didn't know where it was. So he decided on retirement to demolish the house he was living in and, and have... His new house built within his garden in the only place he hadn't ever explored. And guess where the palace was? In the place that he'd never, ever explored. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That It always happens. It's like a good woman, Goff. Yeah, they're hard to find. They're hard to find. <laughs> Moving on. The surprise find solves a 200-year-old mystery. Um, there are certain Charles Pohl, 82-year-old disabled. He lost his wife very recently. Um, the Bishop's Palace dates back to the 1200s and disappeared from the records by about the 1700s. Retired banker Charles Whizzlebutt, Somerset, when the builder saw the remains, he was ordered to stop work. It came as a surprise, but no surprise. They knew it was there, but they didn't know where it was. 
Uh, it, was, it was exciting to hear the site contains something of real uh, significance, but it's cost me £15,000 and a delayed building of my brand new bungalow. Foundations and floor remnants have been found so far and pottery dated back as far as the 1100s. The site will be properly explored before being protected and covered, allowing Charles's building work to continue. But they've had to reorientate the complete building around the archaeology. Um, he's had to foot the bill. And I'm just thinking that when things like this are found, maybe the state should foot the bill because this, is, um, this isn't his fault that he's got archaeological remains in his garden. Uh, the widow who planned, who, who was already pl planning to sell his house in the front part of the garden, so he could move in the back part of the garden. Um, it doesn't sound fair, but that's the way it goes. Um, I'm pleased they have found it, but I'm not pleased that I've got to fork out all this money for a building that once belonged to the bishops of Bath and Wells. Um, Bishop um, Drakesford, yes, Drakesford. Um, and Bishop Ralph of Shrewsbury, you had to put a Ralph in there, uh, were among the owners back in the um, 1300s, but it goes back to the 1200s. Um, I've lived here um, on, since 1974. We've always known about the history of the place, but never found anything. Then right in the corner, the corner that they'd never explored was the palace, and they found it. Amazing. I tell you what, that is amazing. It's, it's, it's one of those amazing things. So um, what I'm going to do, um, we're, we're going to we're going to take a break now, and um, and if, if there's no questions for me now, that's where we're going to go. So I'm going to get a cup of tea, and uh, do you know what? Whatever these drugs I'm on, I'm actually doing the trick. You do look better. Yeah. Oh, J Jane, I, I I only gave you five pounds. You didn't have to go as far as that. <laughs> um, I look at Chris. She wants to say something. The, the out does Jane. Go on, Jane. Go on, say it. Um, I'll, I'll let the other Chris. Do I look Chris a good Chris? You look better than you have, yes. <laughs> That's not saying oh, a lot. Shut up, you. And oh, by the way, this facial hair. Horrible. It, it, it's for I a new film. People with beards like that. It's for a new film I've been asked to do, and also, uh, also. Benefited the drugs as well. Shut up, you. Um, and also, I said to <laughs> Michelle, I said, look, look in in my beard, you can actually see white hairs, and she says. I don't get that close to you to actually see those white hairs. What does that say about our relationship? And then finally, finally, before I go off on my break, right, finally, um, I, 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 with, with this film role that I've been shortlisted to do, right, whether I'll get it is for a new medieval film, and I'm, I'm acting alongside a, a famous number one female actor, um, whose name I shall not um, say if, I, if I'm spelt it down. Um, Who is it? Helena Bonifel Carter. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, um, but anyway, I've actually got to go up to her and kiss her and everything. But anyway, um, oh. no, actually, it's not a Bonifel. It's not um, Helena Bonifel Carter. I don't know the name of this um, number one actor. Does she know that yet? Who, Michelle. <laughs> anyway, the, the, one, the one thing as well is, the other thing as well is, is that um, I then phoned my mum and I said, look, I've been shortlisted to do this film. And she said, uh, all right. And I said, oh, look, i got to play naked. Uh, and no, I don't have to. And my mum said, I'm not telling any of my friends that you're in a film naked. And I said, mum, won't you be proud of me uh, playing a naked role in a film? And she said, no, I certainly won't. And I won't be watching a film and I'll completely disown you. So that's a way of getting rid of your parents, isn't it? On that note, Ella's just joined us and I'm having a break. <laughs> there we go. Carl. Yes, darling. Uh, yes, darling. The, um, I'll blow you a kiss. So, so the law basically states that, that, that if, if a developer finds something, they have to pay for it. Well, I, actually, actually... That seems a bit of a strange law. If that's, no, surely that's the law that needs to be fought, if because if, that's where they're hiding everything. So, so but ba basically, basically, um, I'll give you a bit of archaeological background. <laughs> Goff knows a bit of this. In 2006, there was, a, uh, not 2007, in 1997, there was a law which was brought in, which was called PPG 16, which is Pal um, um, Planning Policy Note number 16. And that stipulated that within the planning process, then um, if archaeologists deem that there is an archaeological resource on site, which the, which the local council pays the Glamorgan and Gwent Archaeological Trust locally to be their archival archaeologists. If the archival archaeologists deem that there's archaeology on the site, then as a precondition of planning, 
the local the, the developer has to pay an archaeologist to do a watching brief of a desktop survey or something like that and if the archaeologists on that excavation deem that the archaeology is important enough on the advice from the Glamorna Grant Archaeological Trust locally, um, then the developer has to pay for every single day the archaeologist is on site. Now, any archaeological work that I do, if you want me on site for one single day, um, yeah. I will charge £650 for one day um, uh, analysis, which would include the preliminary research the re report afterwards and every day that I'm on site, we charge 250 quid a day. Um, um, a, a project, I'll give you a bit of a background. I was the archeologist who, um, who undertook the watching brief at Boverton Mill Farms on two occasion for two separate developers. Um, and on the first development that we had, um, the, the total bill for, from archeology span to the developer was 8,000 quid. I, I'm sure that the, the idea is that it protects the archaeology. But if, yes, it is. If, if that's what's making them hide the archaeology and destroying it, it then that's not a good thing. I actually agree. I, I think it should be paid by... Um, put it this way, right? If Goff wants to, if Goff wants to put um, an extension on his house that has to involve um, any masonry of any kind, if it's a wooden extension, you don't need planning permission. Uh, but if, if you need foundations then um, Goff, he hasn't got a lot of money, as you know, right? Goff would have to factor in the cost of the archaeologist to do a watching brief on site. Either that or not. Um, hmm. But I'm not sure it's protecting the archaeology anyway. Well, the, 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 the archaeologist... Is obviously what it was meant to, to be doing. Exactly, but the archaeologists decide... Ah, uh, but you're saying... The archaeologists have already decided that um, Goff has to have a watching brief on his conservancy. Goff has to pay for it. And if, if Goff doesn't have an archaeologist on site, his, his planning permission is revoked and he cannot continue with his conservancy, a, a yeah, conservatory. Right? But if there's archaeology found on the site that, um, that the archaeologist didn't know was there and Goff doesn't have an archaeologist on site, yeah. right? and then he declares there is archaeology there, um, the archaeologist might declare that Goff has to pay for the archaeological work. In doing so, Goff has extra expenses that he didn't want to fork out in the first place. Would you do that? You'd probably cover up the archaeology, and I fully understand exactly. what you're saying. Exactly, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's like when they're building this housing estate by me, yeah. It's had its archaeological check, but if they Benefit. find anything else now, you don't find anything until you start digging it all up. Exactly. So, exactly. so when they start, when they're digging it up now, they're not going to say a word, are they? Exactly. Exactly. For 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 example, um, for for example, I I an, an archaeological site in Barry that already had a watching brief, and I've still got this on my desk. An archaeological site um, um, which had a watching brief in Barry uh, mm. at the beginning of the year. Of development has actually been um, given the go-ahead, and there's me wandering across the site, and I'm get, coming across bits of uh, human mandible um, being churned up across the site. So children looking in their gardens in years' time will find bits of human remains in, which nobody's going to report because they'll have to get the archaeologists in. So I exactly see what your point is. Yeah. And the other thing is, what about that piece of pottery you found on the nap in Barry? Did anyone own up to dumping that soil there? Yeah, that's the point. There, there is actually on my desk still. So, um, no, nobody owned it. Owned up to dumping that soil there. But the case is, is I, I was, I was um, having a photographic shoot at the Roman site in um, in Glanamore, and, and, and my car, my car on the, the car park, all the way down the bottom. I looked down, and there, uh, there was a load of soil. So I got my trowel out, started rooting through with this, and come up with this bit of nice medieval pottery right which probably dates to about the 1100s now i put a, a message on facebook saying if anyone's dumped this soil you're not in any trouble i would like to examine this soil from the garden because you've obviously got archaeology there nobody owned up to it so but, but, but you would they charge 600 quid wouldn't you <laughs> no i no i wouldn't but if i did if i found archaeology in their garden right then any work that they need to do in the future would have to be paid for them for an archaeologist to do work. So, so yeah, you are completely right in what you're saying. So, so a law designed to protect things is actually causing a problem. The law that's designed to protect things is a complete ace. Hmm. And um, as of next month, the archaeology company will be making a major announcement. Um, and um, I won't say any more. So what I'm going to do, I, will, I want to take my break now. <laughs> I want to okay. have a wasp. Break, 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 break. See, I can talk now. Yeah, so. have a break. <laughs> have a break. Goff, just, just mute them, Goff. That's all you got to do.
Something over here. Yeah. Now, so back for part two, and I was asked what a Sebastian was. Now, the one thing about the, the Sebastian, it actually describes the building that we've already seen, the grandiose temple complex dedicated to Aphrodite and the Julio-Claudian Empress. So we've already seen that. So what does the word, what's the etymology of the word Sebastian? What does, <coughs> what does this, what, where does that come from? So they should have just called it the second temple of Aphrodite. So it comes from Greek, Sebastanos, meaning from Sebastia, which was the name of the city um, known as Sivas, located in the central portion of what is now Turkey. So the word Sebastanos is associated with a place in Turkey, but not actually at this site. The name of the city is derived from the Greek word Sebastos, meaning venerable. So there we can there we can say that the Seb Sebastian actually in um, um, oh God Aphrodisias you've got to say it a few times to remember Aphrodisias means it means the venerable temple associated with Aphrodite <coughs> or the venerable temple associated with the uh, Julio Claudio family so it means the venerable temple that's the Sebastius actually in um, Aphrodisius. And by the way, just a few other things. Um, in in um, in two thousand and eight, um, Sebastian um, was the ninety eighth most um, used name to um, for newborn children in the United States. Um, so it's the ninety eighth, and in Sweden, um, so Sebastian in two thousand and seven was the thirty eighth most popular name. So I thought you wanted to know that. Hmm. Always. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, and also you've got Saint Sebastian, but he's he's another he's another um, Sebastian. So there we go. So so what I'm going to do? I've done my Sebastian bit. All for do you see what I did for Kathy? I don't do that for anybody else. You know, because nobody else is as as important as Kathy. You see, <coughs> right? So she anyway, Diane. What's that? She is the Diane. She's definitely the Doya. Or the Goya. Right, anyway, so what we're going to do, um, if anyone hasn't taken... Oh, is, if, if anyone hasn't... Oh, is Chris talking to his missus? Go and tell your missus to make you a cup of tea, Chris. Go on. Oh, she has. <laughs> uh, all right, love. Um, nice to hear you again. Any, anyway, so if anyone wants to do a little sketch, you've got the Sebastian, you've got the Sebastian there on your right. You've got the Agora there with the Agora Stadium. You've got the Agora. You've got the various theatres, the Odeon and the theatre, basically um, more or less the same use. You've got the um, Tetra Phylon. You've got the stadium at the top and you've got the Temple of Aphrodite that we've looked at and you've got the Baths of Hadrian. So what we're going to do, I, I've I've done a cheat today. I told you I was going to cheat and I'm going to cheat and I've got there the website associated with the site in front of us. Um, and this is basically a little... A, a wonderful little website to be honest with you because it was really really useful and I need to uh, put you down there um, Aphrodisius was in ancient terms a medium-sized town now, I've said it's about more like 75 hectares um, so the size route rotates between 72 73 if you include the wall and 75 a population of 10,000 inhabitants which we've mentioned I think the We've already said it's a metropolitan grandeur, architectural design, insular based on, on, on Greek form city. It, it's a, a distinctive um, <coughs> broadcast of what ancient city life was like in the late um, Hellenistic, the late Greek period, and then going into the Roman world. Now, this is rather interesting. After the int international political turmoil in the Mediterranean, the, uh, the Roman revolution of... Uh, roughly around um, 32, about 28 years BC, the city's engagement with outside events were few. So it was sort of involved back then and then it just disappeared. So it was one of those, I think, the engagement that this city has with the, um, with the world is more 
what it's producing rather than look what we've done you know we've got a famous person you know it's a bit like cornwall isn't it is it not that you know we've got tin being exported all around the roman empire and nobody really talks about it because we take it for granted and I think this city's been taken for granted as well. Do you know what? Out of those thousands of vessels that sank in the Mediterranean Sea, I bet you there's one or two vessels that come from this locality with some of the world's finest sculptures on board, right? But obviously they haven't been found yet, but they're, they're out there. Now, what I'd like to do is we're not going to have time to do all these boxes. We've got four there. We've got another four there. We've got quite a lot of them. And I'm not going to do that. But the one thing I'm the one I'm going to actually look at is the one in the top right hand corner, the one involving the cemeteries. Now, the the, the wonderful you can see that's marble. It's, it's a marble sarcophagus and you've got these beautiful carvings. Now, when the family had moved away or, or their dedications to do with the sarcophagus so that the burial had moved, lots of this stuff was gathered together to be used in other building works. And you can see lots of it. And look at that again. Look at that wonderful sarcophagus. And again, I think I think in many ways we 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 take a sarcophagi for granted. And I think in many ways we take burials for granted, as we do in the modern day. But they are... They are very much connected with human existence. We don't talk much about um, the burials of people, but in regards, the, the people of this city did um, want the refinements for the afterlife within their sarcophagus and the burial areas as much as they did in, the, in their life. And look at, oh, hang on a minute. Look, look at this little plan. Hang on a minute. We've missed it. Good. There we go. You can see a little bit more of a stretch. So you've got these 75, you've got this 75 um, hectare area. And throughout this entire landscape, throughout the 500 hectares, you've got other bits of the town. Um, and what you, you do find is that in all these areas where you've got all these, all these little uh, markings, uh, that's basically showing you where lots of tombs have actually been found uh, on the outside of the city. But there's obviously going to be burials within the inside of the city before the city expands. That's a really important thing there. So going back again, so the funerary monuments were a major business for the local marble workshops. Do you know, do you know, I think it was Chris, actually, not Jane. I, I think the issue about what led to the city's decline, it was, um, it was Jim, actually, but I think this links in with some other things. Um, what led to the city's decline, I think maybe because they've used all the buildings of marble you don't need to build any more aphrodite temples you don't need to build any more stadia you uh, the tombs speak for themselves so you've got family vaults so it's quite likely after the big building stuff has occurred there's not really that massive need for um all those mass marble workshops but naturally they continue in the form of the tombs required for the ever-growing dead associated with those people that lived in and around the city and it's talking about there we go aphrodisias also has a large collection of gladiator reliefs from the tombs of entrepreneurs who owned gladiator gladiators and beast hunter schools these trained fighters were for hire to the providers of the Roman style games put on in the city in the honour of the emperors and very much elsewhere. By far the largest category of funerary monuments, however, was marble sarcophagi, the one that you can actually see on the left. Uh, large, expensive, often richly decorated marble coffins. So again, let's let's have another, another little look at something else. So let's let's go down. Do you know what I'm going to do? Let's just sort of look at this city grid a, a moment, right? And just have a little look at this. And then we'll have a look at the walls. That's what that's how we'll do it. This is a more organized plan. And it's very much organized where you've got the, the <coughs> colonnaded um, area actually leading. So so basically, before you go to the games um, in the stadia in the middle there, alongside the baths of Hadrian, uh, you, you go down this great colonnade and over looking over towards the right with a few other buildings you've got the great vast um, the vast theatre 
and obviously you've got another little Odeon, another little theatre. You've got the um, Sebastian over on the right. You've got the you've got the vast temple of the likes of Aphrodite, and you've got the Great Agora. So that gives you a nice little idea of what's going on. Um, another one of these, you know what? I I love it when we actually look at aerial views, and this aerial view taken at a different time of year. The, the other aerial view that we saw earlier on was at the time in the summer when everything looks green. But when you look at an aerial view, uh, let's start again, in the winter where everything's green. But in the, in the obviously, summer months, the, the ground is rather parched. And you, you sort of look over onto the left-hand side and, and, and there's all these weird little um, circular things which probably represents buildings. Um, and if you start to look at the some of the field patterns, it's almost as if some of these might actually represent individual blocks within the city but you've got this wonderful nice little view where you've got lots of the the great buildings within the center it's again a little bit, little bit like stonehenge and uh, not stonehenge get that out of my head it's a little bit like the likes of uh, pompeii where there's lots to learn and over here what you have you have this is the museum complex you've seen the long aisle there they're always adding to the museum so lots to really see lots to know about and do you know what what we then have is we've got another little plan these are all known as insular the, these are little blocks uh, of of a accommodation or in other words if you say right i'm gonna i want to build in insular 23 um then you would say right we're going to build um, a few houses there or the central insula are actually for various um, temples and um, buildings associated with um, authority and so on. And it's likely that in the middle there's lots of remains of really early stuff as well. And they've actually, oh hang on, go back there. They've actually, oh hang on, we missed that again. Right, and where is it? Uh, we missed it, go. So what we've done, they've done a little bit of geophys and what you can see in the geophys is you can see all these little squares and you can see all these little black um, uh, resistance plots which actually show various buildings. So there's hundreds and hundreds of buildings that, that have come up via um, um, geophysics and we've got an idea actually within the Agora, there's actually a temple within the Agora from an earlier period. Within the market area, there's another little bit of a temple. So we, 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 we can learn and let learn from non-intrusive methods of archaeology to actually understand what's, what's more going on. Look at these beautiful plans of what we do know. And there's so much in absence. You know, the, the one thing I, I, I would say is that the baths on the left there, the mark number 18, there's there's some of the larger baths in the Roman Empire, uh, but they're dwarfed by other, lots of the other um, civil um, civic buildings within this wonderful city, and it it's sort of giving you an idea that the um, insular blocks, the 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 city blocks, are uh, in the region of if we want to round there up to about thirty five to forty meters. So so each of those blocks would have had various different buildings. Um, and you've got various streets, um, the, the width of a street being 3.5 metres in width. So it's quite some nice passable distance. And it, then it's talking about the, the um, housing units uh, with, within um, that, that sort of equates more or less with the insula. It's talking about the, the um, sanctuary of Aphrodite and so on. And the Sebastian and the atrium house, lots of atri atrium houses. That's a word that we come more away from Pompeii. So done a little bit of that there. Um, lots of the just just quickly look at this. The the um, nice nice few reconstructions. The um, the civil basilica. There's not much left of that. It's um, all of these. I, I'm sure if we had somebody like Randolph Hearst still, you could say Randolph. Can we just reconstruct all this sort of area in front? And the, 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 the Basilica Civil Area, and we, we'd have that wonderfully reconstructed. It's all there to do. It's all there to do if anyone's got any spare change. So you can see all that. That's the, the Basilica area, and obviously you've got the upright, um, uh, uh, the, the upright um, columns, um, which are um, north of this wonderful stadium, which you can see in different forms. These images are taken at different times, naturally. 
Uh, some of the reconstructions within the um, civil basilica, again, very opulent and very <coughs> Baroque looking and lots of nice little plans that you can actually see. It's a sort of um, Baroque sort of frontage of um, uh, the, f the facade for the basilica and how, from the archaeology, they think it looked like. But moving on, let, let's sort of move on because we've got lots to do. So let's just, what I'd like to do now is the, is the wall. Uh, the city walls. Now, as you can see from these city walls, you can see that there's bits of uh, there's bits of a window there. Um, there's lots of um, um, what what you're going to find is that the the friezes with wonderful carvings are going to be the designs are going to be faced inwards rather than outwards. So if you turn one of these around, you're going to get beautiful um designs on them but th this is this is what's happening to lots of the material that's reused in in a, a marble wall for example and all those little bits of chipping and all the rest of it within the core that's all marble as well coming from the quarry look at that there and now uh, okay, just just go back to that one there look at that there and, and a marble city wall and you can actually find some of the entablature. The entablature there, some nice bit of entablature on the left there. That entablature is, is, is the bit that sits directly on top of the um, the column itself. You could get a bit of a Corinthian um, capital there. And directly above that is what's called entablature. A nice, nice little bit of design. And you can see lots of other little bits of design, but a wall made of marble. Absolutely amazing, that. I think that's great. So so what what we're talking about the, the wall the wall around the city is 3.5 kilometers long i said it was four times the circumference of the likes of maiden castle now maiden castle is four kilometers in in circumference so this is just i have to start again the 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 circumference around maiden castle is one kilometer this is 3.5 kilometers so just under um, four times the circumference of Maiden Castle, that, that wonderful hill fort that is near Dorchester, the <coughs> biggest, one of the biggest hill forts um, in, in the whole of Britain, which is in 50 um, acres in area. So the wall itself, we, we, we've got an idea that it was about 10 metres in height, so that's great, M mainly, mainly the marble, and up to 3.5 metres in thickness, so the width of the streets. So the width of the streets that they're walking down, are actually at the thickness of the wall. Amazing that. So the wall itself dates to about 350. So up until that point, we do believe that the, the site was completely unfortified. What we do get is lots of reports of, of, of cities being damaged and affected by raids and various other things in the south. But this this site is is, is spared any of that. A bit, a bit like Temesos we, we, we looked at a few weeks ago. And so Aphrodisias uh, is a site that would have radically changed with a wall around it. The problem is with a wall around it, it's, it's secluding the, the contents within. But by about 350 and 360, if you want to see the sort of Temple of Aphrodite on the flat um, without the walls, you'd be able to see it. But with the walls, it's going to struggle. But the idea that the vista and what people are trying to broadcast and demonstrate with the city has changed. So you've got this megalithic marble wall around it. Absolutely amazing. Sometimes going through old cemetery areas as well um, and using lots of the material, breaking up the sarcophagus as well, as well to, to, to build these, all, all those different type of um, arguments that we're, that we're talking about in regards to this wall. So again, so we sort of moved down a little bit more. Um, the the French, I, I, I won't sort of basically the the French archaeologist Gordon were the the ones who actually excavate at the city for the first time in 1904. That is the pediment of a temple that was one of the first things to actually be reconstructed at this at, at the site, um, and that that's. That looks quite grand. The columns are now gone, but if we sort of move on again, I just want to show you that in brief. If we sort of move down again, so Hadrianic baths. I I, I like looking at the Hadrianic baths because this is obviously it's got the name of Emperor Hadrian, and I thought that would be really appropriate. So look at these. Don't doesn't that look absolutely whopper? Now the the biggest baths in the Roman Empire were actually at Trier, um, which is in Germany, um, and they were um, associated with Constantine the Great. But these ones actually at um, Af Aphrodias are actually quite substantial as well. And what you can see is is this is is this checkerboard floor plan as you're wandering around the corridors. You've got the great great big walls between the, the bathing areas. The the, the Thermia still standing. The Thermia are big big 
big walls um, within bathhouses and you've got one or two um, lesser examples but very important to us at uh, Roxeter and the likes of uh, uh, the likes of Leicester and if we sort of move on a little bit further with these images that that's it so it doesn't look as big from it doesn't look a big as big from above but back on the ground plan that that sort of angle it looks huge archaeological excavations going on there there, there they go they're still working there and they've been working for quite some time and you've got like a nice little bathing pool you've got a like nice little um, statue there so I, I don't think I'd want to be going to this site when it's um, going to a, a proper um, proper baths. You'd like to be out outside in the cool. To be honest with you, that 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 would be that would be where you'd want want to be. So this is a little bit of a plan of these baths of Hadrian. I just want to sort of give you an idea. <coughs> so the Hadrian's baths were the largest public bath building in Aphrodisias. So there were other bath buildings associated with the Emperor Hadrian. Uh, 117 associated on the western um, side of the south of Gore, Gore the, the market area uh, vaulted bathing chambers it's got there marble um, revetments the floors and pools were lined with marble this this is everything underfloor supports hypercourse I tell you what wandering around those hypercourse would be absolutely great sort of the the um, as the Pele supports the floor actually looking in a hypercourse actually just sort of um, Finding some one or two of the details that actually um, fallen be between the um, gaps would be would be absolutely brilliant. And as I say, we're, we're, I'm trying to get through as much as I can. So if we can, you can go, you can have a look at this site. Um, it's Aphrodisius Classics Ox AC UK. So it's the the Oxford University um, site for for this. It's not very difficult to find. Now. One thing that we never have, we'll do the Sebastian in a minute, but the Sebastian is as important as the quarries, right? And and the quarries themselves are two point four kilometers from the heart of Aphrodisias, in the hills. Oh well, the slopes towards the northeast. But there's one interesting thing about the slopes towards the northeast. Transportation is great because if you if you've got columns, you can basically roll them down to the city. I wouldn't try it. I don't think that's the way they would have done it. But actually, sending down sending um, work material down to the city, um, having a slope, the gradient actually down to this sort of basin where where this um, wonderful city is, uh, would have um, assisted the movement of the wonderful marble, a staple product of the city. Um, saying saying about uh, one question that was asked was was whether Carl do you think that they had um, th that everything was carved in situ well it would have been roughed in situ so in other words if you've got columns they they would have been roughed in situ and a finer detail put in within the city but you're not going to send huge blocks of marble to the city to be worked on it would just not happen right so so um, it's saying it's saying about the quarries were was sufficient to provide the needs of the city for its building as statutory material but were not of a scale that could have supported wide export of the marble as a raw material well I've disagreed with that because the next sentence then says there was probably long distant export of some expensive finished products and a local regional export of some larger categories such as statues and sarcophagi in other words I don't think the writer knows what they're saying there but what I'm saying as 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 a revenue they must have exported substantial amounts of marble but not the substantial amounts of marble that were actually being used in the creation of the city i think that's what that note is actually saying and that's what i'm actually saying as well the marble of aphrodisius uh, was first ex exploited in the late hellenistic period 200 150 years bc um, and we've got the quarries, we've got the dates for them. And I think just sort of looking at a, an image of the quarries there that you can actually see where you've got faces of the quarries where it's all being quarried out. And I, I like this image. A diff oh, hang on. No, 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 no. I like this image because uh, they're, they're, in the, they're up in the right there. That's where the quarries are. Yeah. And you've got, you've got, the, you've got this. It sort of gives an angle of the city. It almost looks as if you've got the heart there, the civic centre. You've got the stadium over in the north there, and there's like nothing else to see. But what you can see is the angle of the baths, and this is actually before the stadium in the middle has been excavated. So it's quite quite an old image actually. This is before lots of this site has actually been excavated. Interesting, but it's a really clear image, no doubt. So. If we if we move there quickly, hang on a minute. I just had it right. This, this one here. 
what it what it's saying here is that these these are the um, the larger ones indicate ow, the the larger ones indicate the the amount of um, cubic meters of marble that they believe are extracted so so 10,000 cubic meters within these large ones alone so there's thousands of cubic meters of marble uh, 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 hundreds of thousands of cubic meters of marble that's actually quarried over this large area to give the the dark marble and the light marble for the construction of the city okay so what i'm going to do i'm going to think of in five minutes we'll be finishing so what can i do in five minutes what one did i say i was going to do yes we were going to look at the sebastian there we go now there is the sebastian look at that there you've got ground floor first floor second floor and that brings the family of the julio augustan family together now this is a point that we've made a few times before if any of these had been removed well i think we've got one or two of these in the british museum i think that they should be given back because it it doesn't complete the story or at least a copy given um to to the people that are actually running the site because by matching all these together you can get the full story the um the julio claudian family um all, all the story about Caligula I want a bit of meat on the bone about Caligula and a bit of Tiberius and Augustus and we, we've all heard about Nero uh, uh, and Claudius so so all, all that is really important stuff um, and look at the detail there oh hang on a minute look, looking down there all of this along here would have been at that level at that level the Sebastian at that level um, not really sure what's going on, on the right hand side but um, but you've got this wonderful marvel paving here as well more scenes um and and Nias, uh flight from troy Aeneas flight from troy there um there Aeneas's flight from troy directly in front of us um and what i'd like to do what was what was i going to show you i missed it didn't i hang on a minute there's a nice little bit of a plan there uh, of our wonderful uh, remains and again marble um flags marble flagstones on the floor so the area that we've looked at is this area here this is the uh, ground first second floor area that you can see on the plan uh, 15 15 meters this is this area so 30 um so you've got uh, 30 90 so you've got about 120 meters in length at least so is that right 30 yeah i think that's about right for my math sorry about that um and it's basically saying that the, uh, the site itself other than uh, what you can see um, and a little bit of uh, assistance excavated in 1979 1981 a grandiose temple complex as we've already explained uh, built in around 20 to about 60 years AD associated with that um, Claudio family um, and obviously Doric Ionic Corinthian orders I've mentioned that some 200 reliefs 200 reliefs were required for the whole project um, more than 80 were recovered in the excavation so there's some there that they haven't excavated right so they haven't excavated the whole site um, we're talking about stories about the Greek um, Greek myths and the Roman emperors personified as being great leaders and we're talking about um, represent it's saying here and a series of personified um, ethni or nations of Augustus's world empire <coughs> from the Ethiopians or Eastern Af Africa to um, Calicia of Western Spain. So in other words, representations of the Roman world were to be seen on display at this site. This is, this is a museum of the age, and obviously we're talking about our representation of Britannia. So much more information there, so much more to read, which, which I'll leave you guys, if you go onto the website, to actually digest all that. So um, unbelievable that. So as we sort of filter through now, that's just, um, we've grabbed the Sebastian, we've done the quarries, as I say, a lot more to actually look at there. Um, I probably want to sort of um, finish at the theatre. You can look at the stadium details and the uh, the South Agora and the the um, stadia there and everything else. Sculptures workshop that that's well that's well worth a, a visit. Looking at that information, let's just sort of go on and uh, excavated in the nineteen sixties. The sculptures workshop, the real evidence. So you got the workshop remained active to at least until uh, AD 400, as is shown by the costume and style of the unfinished portrait statue um, found in the main room of the workshop. For some, so what's ever's happening? Uh, this permanent facility for about 300 years, and then suddenly 
things change. Thing, things change. Uh, what, what's happening with the city alters everything. So those two last slides, let's just see them. Tetra uh, pylon. Tetra pylon itself is um, a, a grand. You see these in quite a number of cities. Uh, Tetra pylon was the monumental columnar entrance to the sanctuary of Aphrodite. Probably at sort of um, probably at four roads, and one of them leading directly into the temple area. It's basically saying supported on sixteen columns, supporting elaborate pediments. I think on all four um, four <coughs> um, angles. Uh, compasses um, a co complete stone for um, stone reconstruction um, of the structure using 80% of the original blocks uh, was completed in 1991 with one or two as I said um, of the original features still standing one entered on the east side from a major north south street and passed through the gate into a large open uh, forecourt before the sanctuary proper so good uh, good good description there and obviously uh, you've got the association of Aphrodite um, and there you go rather interesting and the figure of Aphrodite framed in an um, acanthus calynx the acanthus um, representations that the Romans uh, use associated with their um, Corinthian carvings um, in the center the lunette was erased uh, the, the, the the detail in the center was erased in the Christian period and replaced with a crudely engraved gr cross so in other words I think it was Chris, wasn't it? So um, the 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 deity of Aphrodite has changed to being the new representation, and probably uh, it's it's likely as well that the temple turned to have a Christian bent, uh, but that's to be discussed and read about again. And finally, the last thing I'd like to say uh, is looking at, for example, the theatre. Um, I'll, I'll <coughs> let you guys read about this. And, but look at this there. The, um, the frontage of the stage would have been of three stories. And I do believe we've got a reconstruction of, hang on a minute, where's there a bit of a reconstruction? I'm sure there was. There you go, three stories, ground, first, um, second floor. And we know the artist who created this. Isn't that great? So we've got the ground floor level still there. Um, and the, the artist, if we, uh, if we go back again, um, the, the artist was a, a Zulos. Um, so there we go. Building was added by Zulos. We, we, the, 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 the artesian, the grassman Zulos was the architect who was responsible for this in 28 years BC. So um, what I'd like to do is actually finish there. We've obviously got a site with wonderful marble seating. Wonderful complex here. Again, the, the archaeology says it all stage you can imagine performances um keith is going to be now my manager we're going to do regular performances we're going to do the zoom classes from there every week um and it's again something that tells us of everything that was rome and everything that was ancient greece at the same time on that note bit knackered so we're going to call that a day and let's sort of stop the sharing are there any questions Hmm. I think I've blown you all away, haven't I? <laughs> have they found any? Uh, have they found any mosaics at all there? Mosaic floors? Do you know what? That that's like a massive curveball because, do you know what? I've not seen. Do you know what? I, I'm lacking lots of areas because this was, this was two lectures. If I'd have done all that, the answer is I don't know, but. Obviously, yes, because it's a representation of Rome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm going to be vague. Sorry, but I'm going to say I'm going to say I haven't seen any, but they must yeah. have because the, um, that was that's one of the markers of Roman civilization mosaic um, mosaic floors. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Um, thanks, <coughs> thanks, Keith, Chrissy, babes. Yeah, thanks. Very interesting. Thanks, Carl. Uh, that that's good. And Arnold. No, very interesting. No questions. Um, Ellen, we haven't heard a bit from you. Do you want to say anything? Um, no, the bit I did lovely. Thank you very much. Um, only two questions. Where was the Temple of Aphrodite? Oh, that was, that was directly above the Agora. No, is that in Cyprus or somewhere else? Oh, no, the Temple of Aphrodite is here. Um, oh, right. The, you actually mean the, the, the other Temple of Aphrodite in Cyprus. Yeah, that, the, there's one there, yeah. And the Roman 
Aphrodite and everything, yeah. But the actual te the actual deity, the actual hub of Aphroditeism was actually Aphrodisius, which we've actually looked at now, with the temple and the tetraphylon actually leading into the courtyard of this wonderful temple that's there. Right. And then the Hadrianic Baths, you showed a picture um, of the bath area and then there was an area of tiles outside it. Yes. They're just like mine in the pool in the dining room. <laughs> I, I was actually thinking of that. I was actually thinking, yeah. do yours date from about the 1950s or 40s or something like that? No, 1840s. Ah, yours. Oh, yours are the good old Vicky ones, right? Okay. Yeah. Nice and good, good old Vicky. Thanks for that. Um, I, 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 I didn't know that, but that's a nice little interesting thing there. Well done. Um, Goff. Yeah, another one for the bucket list. Oh, yeah. you got. I tell you what, we got problems, guys, because my bucket, the handle, broke off that. Um, so what we'll do, we'll we'll hear from the rabble, and and their elected representative is allowed to speak, Kathy. Come on, they've got a chance to speak. Come on, come on. No, they don't want to speak this. One thing, one thing, Carl. I hope you're getting a part in a film over Johnny Depp. Actually, actually I, I, I'm deeply in love with Johnny Depp, and um, I, I, um, we won't talk about that. He's a wife beater. He's not a wife beater. No, he's not. And we won't go down that avenue. So other than that, um, I've really appreciated... Um, I've really appreciated uh, you guys today and I will no doubt see you all next week. Rise and shine. We're going to the Canary Islands next week and hopefully at that stage, mm. Goff will have brought some Madeira cake back, um, which has nothing <laughs> to do with it. Yeah, and I, I will be eating it in the class. Do you know Do you know what, right? I, I don't tell Goff, right? But the reason why I want him to stay in my classes is because of the Madeira cake. You'll get some when we get there. Yeah, uh, and you know what? I'll keep you to that because you keep to your promises. I don't keep to my promises in regard to Jim. Ooh. Right, there you go. Whoa. Anyway, on that note, and I'll give me some fudge as well, Goff, when I get to walk. Yeah, on that note, many thanks for today. I've really enjoyed that. I've actually I've really enjoyed that. That's great. So, um, Keith, I'll see you next week. Chris, Chris, Goff, bye. Alan, bye. Andrea, bye, Jim, Kathy, and Karen the Witch. Bye. bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye, children. Bye-bye, son. Keith, bye-bye, my son, Keith. I'll give you a kiss on the... On the you need to go some hair. Go Good. Ta-ra. I love my Chris's. <laughs> he said, what's going on, Arnold? <laughs> Arnold, Arnold, bloody silly son. <laughs> Oh God, I can't handle this anymore. But I, 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 I yeah, I'm, I'm my secret. I tell you what, um, if I went through a scanner now, my body is full of silver. What? Ah, uh, be, because the 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 medicine I'm actually on is actually um, is is basically um point nine 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 silver um particles. Oh. Apparently, it's 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 good for the system. So on that Joe, note, have you melted down? I'm going to say you're worth more <laughs> dead than alive, then. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for that, love. <laughs> <laughs> Great melted down, right? Great. Yeah, I'm, basically, when you're I am the new Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be back. <laughs> no, I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, I'm going now. I, I, I'll see you. Bye. 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 Bye, -bye hermaphrodites. Bye. Bye. <laughs> God, that was a nutty one. That was good. I'm going to chuck that straight on. I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much for watching. Carl James Langford, Archaeology Camry. Brilliant recording. Thank you.